Well, this is week two of, um, of our series called Hope in the Dark. We started on Easter Sunday and last weekend took a break so we could enjoy the voices of Lee. How many enjoyed the voices last week? Come on, let me hear you. Aren't they awesome? And um, we, we're in this series, though. We're just calling it Hope in the Dark. We're trying to, to raise everybody's hope level, trying to get the, the level of hope because the Bible says a lot about what we can do with hope and a lot about what we cannot do without hope. It's important for us to raise our level of hope, not just any kind of a Pollyanna kind of hope that's here today and gone tomorrow, but I'm talking about a real, tangible, sustainable practical hope that we can live with that will keep our expectations high. We're using God's Word and we're using characters from out of the Bible to teach us how God taught them to elevate their hope. And um, last week we started off the series with the best place to start when you're going to talk about hope and that is with the person of Jesus. How many know Jesus is always a good place to start when you're talking about hope? And then this week, we're going to talk about a guy. I like this guy because his character is a lot like you and a lot like me. He's a very real human, a guy by the name of Gideon. And uh, we're going to talk some about, about this, this person um, in the Bible by the name of, of Gideon. But before we, we start there and really get into Gideon's life, uh, I want to just, just um, find out if it's true what I believe that a lot of us are a lot like Gideon, and, and, and that is this. Anybody ever ever get into that mode where um, you, just, you just feel like something's going to go wrong, like it's going to go wrong, it's not going to be good, this is going to be bad. Come on, anybody, anybody ever get there? Y'all are, see, some of y'all are there, right? Anybody there right now? Don't look at your spouse, just look at me. Eyes on me, all right? But, but, but Gideon was one of those guys. Oh, it's not going to be good, it's going to be bad, something bad is going to, is going to happen. And God kind of, God kind of shows up. In, in that moment, in that season in Gideon's life. And, and today what I want to talk to you about this is this next level of, of how do we increase hope in our life? How do we live with a greater level of hope? A tangible, practical, real hope that doesn't shift with the sand and doesn't blow in the wind. But how do we maintain a, a tangible hope in our life that, that enables us to, to do what God has put on the inside of us to do and accomplish the things even when things around us aren't good? We learn that from, from, Gideon's, from Gideon's life. It's a, it's a powerful story out of the book of Judges, Judges chapter, chapter 6. There's really three things that I want to tell you today about, uh, about an attitude change or three lessons that we learn through the life of, of Gideon. The book of Judges is, um, is a book that was written before the time of kings, and it's important to know that, and it's, it's a, a, about judges, and you have to ask the question, what is a, what is a judge? And, and, and a judge is just a leader, basically a leader who got Israel out of trouble whenever they were, they were in trouble, and in this book, the book of Judges, the problem with Gideon's character is the Bible, this book talks more about Gideon than any other judge. It's the longest story in the book of Judges, and the problem is he's the biggest wimp in the whole book. I mean, he is a coward, and he's a wimpy, wimpy judge. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Let's check this out, beginning in verse 1. Again, remember this, it's going to come back later. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them to the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of the Midianites was so oppressive. Now, most scholars and historians tell us that that the um, Israelites had about 20,000 weak warriors. These armies that are rising up against them have about 120,000 strong, well-fed, well-prepared warriors. You begin to see the, the picture in the margins. It goes on and, and, and says, The Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain cliffs, caves, and strongholds. Now here's what that means. These cowards were hiding out in caves. Then he goes on. It says, whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, the Amalekites, and other eastern people invaded their country, they camped out on their land, they ruined their crops all the way to Gaza, and they did not spare a living thing. Listen to this. For Israel, neither their sheep, nor their cattle, nor their donkeys. It's going to come back a little later in the story. Then in verse 5. It says, they came up, speaking of the, the enemy, they came up 
with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. He says it was impossible to count all the men and the camels. They invaded the land and they ravaged it. Midian so impoverished Israel that Israel cried out to the Lord for help. Now here's what's important to know about this passage. Israel wasn't preparing for war. They weren't in war. They were already overcome. They were, they were already occupied. They were 100%, totally, utterly, com- com- completely occupied. This, this season in Israel's life represented a season of, of failure. They were like that team that never expects to win because they're so used to losing. And God shows up in their, in their lives in, in, in that situation. And Gideon, the character that's, that we're going to talk about today, that we're going to learn from today, he was afraid. He was, he was petrified. He'd gotten overwhelmed because of the circumstances that were were around them. And it's really pretty funny what God says. It's kind of funny when you look down and and, and God speaks to to, to Gideon. And he says, listen, you guys have been sinning. He said, because of that, your land's been occupied by the enemy. You're literally starving to death. But then God says, but I'm getting ready to do something different. He says, I'm going to turn this thing around. He says, I'm going to use you, little weak you, and you're going to kick out the oppressors. You're going to get your land back. Now, I don't know if you ever um, go to the movies, but there's a very famous movie. Made millions of dollars. And um, they ripped up, they, li- they literally ripped this story right out of the Bible and made a movie about it famous Oscar nominated movie, Grammy award winning movie. And they just, this movie, the whole movie is about this story that that we're reading about in Judges chapter 6. You know what the movie is? A Bug's Life. How many of you have seen A Bug's Life? I watched it on the airplane, A Bug's Life. It's the, they ripped it off. Hollywood ripped off the Bible to make the movie. You know, you know the movie. They planted all their crops and once a year the grasshopper would come in and grasshoppers would devour their crops, right? And then Gideon is that one little ant, the one little bitty ant who's been, who's been called, you're going to overthrow the wicked grasshoppers. And that's kind of the story. Gideon, Gideon was that guy. So why should this matter to you? Why is that really important to, 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 to me? Why do we need to know? Because, listen, you and I are a lot like Gideon. We're a lot like, like Gideon. The Bible says when you read a little further, here's where God finds Gideon. It says Gideon, he's a bread maker, but it says he's pressing bread in the wine press. Now, how many know you don't make bread in the wine press, you make wine in the wine press? So what's a bread maker doing in a wine press? Here's what he's doing. Number one, he's hiding from God because he knows they've done evil in the sight of God. And number two, he's hiding from the enemy because he knows the enemy isn't going to look for a bread maker in the wine press. So Gideon's hiding from God in a place that, he, that, he, that he's not supposed to, to be. The angel of the Lord shows up and he identifies himself as a messenger of God. Gideon, of course, doesn't believe that it's, that it's really, really God. And he says, I'm going to need some miracles to prove it. And the first thing God lets this, this, this angel do is burn up a bull. He says, hold on, let me go get a sacrifice. And he comes and gets this bull, throws it up on the altar. He doesn't strike a match. He doesn't, um, what's, what's it called when you do that? Rubbing your sticks together. That, he didn't do that. He didn't do any of that. God just, poof, from heaven, started a fire. Saw this miracle fire. See, you think like I do. We hadn't, sp- hey, we hadn't spent much time in the woods, have we? But he starts this fire. And then, and then Gideon says, well, that's not, that's, not a, that's not enough. He says, I want you to do a miracle with my fleece. How many, know, how many have heard the story, the miracle of the fleece? Well, let, me, let me tell you. How many know what a fleece is? All right, it's real easy. A fleece is like a piece of carpet, but it's made out of animal skin. That's it. It's, a fleece. it's made out of animal skin. It's more like a bath mat. It looks like a bath mat. So this could be the miracle of the bath mat. And the Bible says that Gideon takes his bath mat and he throws it out in the yard and he says, God, here's what I need you to do. I need to wake up tomorrow morning and I want the land around me to be dry, but I want that bath mat to be soaking wet. Gideon gets up the next morning Walks outside, the land is dry. He picks up that bath mat. He has to wring it out. It's so wet. Wrings the water out of that. How many know that's enough to make me believe? But, but get, not for Gideon. Gideon, see, see, we're a lot more like Gideon because it usually takes more than one thing for us. Gideon says, no, 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 no. That's not enough. I need you to reverse the miracle. God's like, what? 
Yeah, I need you to reverse the miracle. Tomorrow morning, if it's really you, I want to get up and I want all the land to be soaking wet, but I want the bath mat to be dry. And God's like, you know, Gideon, I am God. I created water, and this is an easy thing for me. So the next morning, Gideon gets up, and he walks outside, and he's having to take his shoes off to walk over to the mat because the ground around him is saturated, soaking wet. But he gets to the mat, and guess what? He picks up that mat, and the mat is dry. Now, before I get to the main point, I want to do a little side sermon on fleeces. Because even though we ought not to, we still do use this fleece mindset on God. God, if it's really you, I want you to do this. And then if you do this, God, then I'll know it's you. We're really testing God. And, and we, don't really, we don't usually do it the right way. We forget that God wants to talk to you. You don't need a fleece. Listen, God spent the entire Old Testament trying to rip the veil that separated him from us. And because you are a New Testament believer, a New Covenant believer, that means the God who used to not be able to live in you can now live in you through the Holy Spirit and talk to you. If Listen, you don't need a fleece because you can hear from God. But we still throw out fleeces. We say crazy things like, God, if it's your will for me to date this person, you're a believer. You know they're not a believer. They're not following the ways of God. They don't care anything about God. They've been abusive and mean to other people. But, you know, your ship's selling like the good ship lollipop, and you're going to fix everything in their life. But, God, is it still your will for me to, God, if it's your will, make my phone ring in the next 10 minutes. And you know your mama calls you every 10 minutes. That's not a fleece. Listen, if you're going to throw out a fleece, you need to throw out a fleece that's equal to Gideon. Say something like, God, if it's really you, I want you to make my refrigerator levitate. I want you to spin it around a few times. And if none of the milk spills out, then I'll know it's you. No, not us. We throw these, you know, little, little fleeces out to, you know, to, to, to test God and, and and you don't have to do that because the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you and you can hear the voice of God. You can, can hear that, that voice. Well, in this, this story, we, we see God show up and, and provide these three miracles. And you'd say, well, Scott, I, I don't get it. Why is this important for me? Here, here's the reason it's important for you. This is, why, this is why I think we should care. Because a lot of, thing, a lot of folks think you're going to get what you deserve. But listen, in life, you do not get what you deserve. I know people told you, yeah, you get what you deserve. No. How, how many of you know a jerk who got promoted? Come on, you know somebody who's just downright crazy and mean and annoying and they got promoted. See what I mean? You don't get what you deserve. How many know somebody, how many know somebody who's good, just does everything they can do to get it right, to be right, to be good, yet bad things still happen to them? See, we, we don't, in life, we don't get what we deserve. We get what we expect. Which is the reason I'm talking to you today about expecting more. About how do you let God raise your level of expectation so you begin, listen, so that you begin to expect the things that God expects. That's what this whole story is about. God is changing Gideon's expectation. God is trying to get, listen, Gideon to expect what God expects. God is trying to get Gideon to expect more, not from what he's seen in his past, but from what God has said. Listen, the greatest thing any of us will ever do in this area of expectation in our lives is to figure out how do I align my expectations with the expectations of me, of the one who made me. 
when we, can, when we can learn to listen to the voice of God, to align our expectations with, with God's expectations for us, things begin to happen. But how many know you, you, you can't change your expectations until you change your attitude? Because, listen, here's the reason why. Your attitude, my attitude, our attitudes are the engine of our actions. Our actions are determined by the engine, which is our attitude. And sometimes we have to have an attitude adjustment. And that's what God's doing with Gideon. Gideon is, Gideon is getting an attitude adjustment from God as God is teaching him how to raise his expectations in, in, his, own, in his own life. Listen, how many know an attitude matters? Your attitude, my attitude, it always matters because our attitude produces our actions. And God is getting Gideon's attention. He's going to begin to change Gideon's, Gideon's attitude, his vision for his life. Another way to, to say, I want to I help you expect more. I want to help you change the expectation of your life. Would be to say, I want to increase your vision for your life. I remember as a student pastor, I, I talked to kids and... Um, and, and you say things to teenage boys like, hey, um, so listen, it's just us right here, and I want to talk to you about, about God and your life and about your, your, your future. What's your, what's your mission for your life? You ask a teenage boy, what's your mission for your life? And a teenage boy will look at you like my dog looks at me when he doesn't understand my command. No, really, what's your vision? I, I, don't, I don't get it. I don't understand. What, what's your purpose? What's your mission for life? I, okay, okay, listen. When God formed you in your mama's womb, what did he have in mind for you? Okay, listen. What are you going to do after high school? Oh, I get it. Crazy boys, they'll say like, oh, I've got a couple of cousins and one of them's got a, a Wii and the other one's got the Xbox and, and I got PlayStation. We're going to get an apartment together and we're going to have the three best game stations on the, on the planet. And you look at that kid like, what? wait, 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 your vision for life is getting all three game stations in an apartment with two other guys who have no bigger vision for their life than that? Now, how many would say that's a pretty low standard of vision? That's a pretty low expectation. But you know what we do? We, 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 we do the same thing to the opposite extreme. We create these expectations of ourselves, expectations of other people, expectations of our careers, expectations of our finances, expectations in the areas of our life that are so, so wide and so deep and so unrealistic that we drive ourselves and the people around us crazy because of wrong expectations. Here's what I want you to understand. That you, can, you can have expectations that are too high. That will drive you crazy. And then you'll drive everybody else crazy. Or you can have expectations that are too low. That will never help you get to the place that God called you to get to. The goal, listen, the goal is to hear from God. To get into a place that you're peace with God. That's what we're going to finish talking about. So that your expectations, listen to me, the only person, your mama shouldn't be able to define her expectations of you. Your daddy shouldn't be able to define his expectations of you. Now, we're not talking about your behavior when you're a minor living in, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about your life and your future. Are we on the same page? So don't go home saying, preacher said, you can't tell me what to do, mama. I'm, no, that's not what the preacher said. All right. Listen to me, the only one, the only one who you should give authority to define your expectations is the one who designed you and formed you in your mama's womb and knows you. And when you can align your expectations with his expectations, that's when you and I begin to live the abundant life that God called us to live. And that's what God's trying to do in this story in, in, in Gideon's life. And here's the first point that I'll, I'll give you. We're going to go, listen, here's our goal today. Let God, let God define our expectations. Here, here's number one, first attitude adjustment or lesson that we learn, and that's this. Number one, change your definition of what's possible. 
You want to you really build sustainable hope in your life? A tangible, sustainable hope. That's what God's doing in Gideon's life. He's saying, he's saying listen, Gideon, we got to help you change your definition of what's possible. Anybody ever had an Eeyore in their life? Come on, y'all know Eeyore? Eeyore, y'all, y'all hadn't watched enough Winnie the Pooh. Winnie the Pooh, Eeyore's in, in Winnie the Pooh, and he's like, wah, 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 wah. Good, good thing. If you're at Eeyore and you're here today, listen, we love you. You're welcome, but we're going to pray God transforms you, you know, because here's the good thing about Eeyore. They're very loyal. Eeyore's are very loyal. The problem with Eeyore's is they, they never believe things are possible. Uh, nothing ever changes. It's going to be bad. Oh, the sky's always falling. Anybody know an Eeyore? Anybody sitting next to one? Don't look. Don't look. Look straight at me. Look straight at me. All right, stay out of trouble. I mean, an Eeyore, you go to an Eeyore, and you, you say to an Eeyore, like, like, I'm having relationship problems. My, me and my wife, you know, we're just having problems. And Eeyore looks back at you, and he says, it's okay. God loves single people, too. And you're like, wait a minute. You've already got me divorced. You go to Eeyore, and you got, you know, money problems, and, and, and Eeyore's like, it's okay, we'll be poor together, we'll starve together, we'll, 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 pro- we'll you know, we'll, we'll, we'll die, we'll die together. You got problems at work, Eeyore, I'm having problems at work, ah, there's always an unemployment check. Yeah, I'm already fired. You know, we've all been around Eeyore's. And, and Gideon, God shows up, and Gideon's just a big old Eeyore. L- listen to this. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, the Lord said to him, You are a mighty warrior. Gideon doesn't even buy it. Gideon's like, This is, this is, Gideon's like, You know my family? Do you know where I'm from? Do you know my tribe? Have you seen my resume? I've lost so much. I don't even expect to win. I am just the chief of all the losers. And, 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 and it's funny. God is, here's what God's doing. God is trying to reshape, redefine what's possible because you can never do the, the, the possible in your life until your identity is right. In your Bible or somewhere out to that verse, out beside, I want you to write the word identity because you have to understand what God is trying to do in Gideon's life is reshape, reframe his identity. He says, you are a warrior. I know you're hiding in the wine press, trying to make bread in the, in the wine press, but I'm about, he says, God, God says to Gideon, Gideon, listen, if you, will, if you will just listen to me about your identity, it will change your whole circumstances. God is trying to, listen, God is trying to infuse Gideon with hope. And Gideon, Gideon comes back and he says, but God, if the Lord is with us, why is all this stuff happening to us? Now to the side of your notes, I want you to write Circumstances. Because Gideon does what we so often do, and we blame our circumstances on God. God says, Gideon, I want to change your identity. You're a mighty warrior. Gideon comes back with, well, what about all these problems? I mean, if, if you were really with us, God, then we wouldn't be going through all of these problems. You ever notice how quick we are to blame all of our problems on God? Even when, listen, the majority of our problems are authored by us. Why am I having marriage problems? Why is my marriage a mess? Probably because one or both of you are living in disobedience to the Word of God. It's probably as simple as husbands aren't loving their wives the way they need to be loved and and wives aren't respecting their husbands the way they need to be respected. It's just because we're living in disobedience. Somebody's living in disobedience. God, why am I having so many money problems? God, if you loved me, you would fix my money problems. No, no. Your money problems are because you've used your Visa card too much. But we, we, we blame our circumstances on God. But here's the reality. We author most of our circumstances. And God is saying to Gideon, Gideon, if you will let me change your identity and get your identity right, knowing who you are will begin to change what you're going through. God says, if you'll let me 
get your identity in order, then your circumstances will come into order. What Gideon's really asking is, why do bad things happen to good people? That's what Gideon's saying. If you're really God, why is all this? God, he's really just saying, listen, God, why do bad things keep on happening to, to good people? Can I tell you one of the keys to making hope rise up on the inside of you? when we get honest about who authored our circumstances. Listen, when, when we get honest about who authored our circumstances, it's amazing, it, it, it's just amazing how much more hopeful we become when we get honest. Because if I can admit that I made the mess, I can probably figure out how to clean up the mess. But so many times, we never restore our hope because we spend our time blaming everybody else on the mess we're in. And the reality is, most of the messes that we get in in life are authored in some way by us. And God is trying to show Gideon, Gideon, if, 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 you, can, if you can just get a glimpse, if you can let your identity change, if you can see yourself as I see you, Yes, I've seen your resume. Yes, I know that your family's been full of compromise and been full of failure. Yes, I know what the enemy has not only come against you, attacked you, but occupied your land. Yeah, I know exactly. I know you're weak. I know you're a coward. But I am trying to tell you the way I see you. And when you begin to see you the way I see you, everything you do begins to change. But nothing can change until your identity gets right. He says, you're a mighty warrior. Some of you are here today and you're living hopeless lives because your identity needs to be corrected. You have began to believe that you are who people say you are. That you are what your circumstances say you are. That you are what your culture has said and your enemy has said you are. I'm here to tell you today, listen, my opinion of you is irrelevant compared to God's opinion of you. One of the greatest things, I'll tell you, one of the greatest lessons I've learned in my life, and you can learn in your life, is to know who you are. When people say you're one thing, and you refuse to allow your identity to be defined what people say about you, because you know what God has said about you, your hope can survive the greatest storms in life. But when you begin to believe that you are who other people say you are, it will shatter your hope. God is saying to Gideon, Gideon, if you will just begin to believe you are who I say you are. The next thing that Gideon does is listen to this. This is a powerful, powerful passage. He goes on down and Gideon says this. Well, God, where are all the wonders that our father told us about? When they said that, did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? God, why did my older brothers get to see all the miracles? You know what he's doing? He's comparing. Co listen, comparison is always destruction. Compa listen, comparison will always rob your contentment. That wasn't mine. Somebody told me that on the way out after the 915 service. Wasn't that good? Comparison will always rob your contentment. I mean, I, I think in myself, I, I struggle with this, and I have to keep on top of my mental, emotional, and spiritual game. When I go to speak somewhere, I'm very, very vulnerable to comparing myself. When I will go over to a free chapel and speak for Jensen Franklin, or go to Mount Perrin and preach for a David Cooper, or sit in front of my dad and, 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 and preach, it's very easy for me to say, who am I? Why am I here? I don't want to preach after them. Those guys are like communication machines. They've, they've forgotten more than I've ever even learned. I've, not, I've got no business standing on a platform after them. I compare myself. And it's destructive. 
I allow myself to live with that mindset, I will never fulfill what God has put in me to fulfill. I will never accomplish the expectations that God has for me, and neither will you. Listen to me, ladies, whenever you see another lady walk into the room, and I know you, I watch you, you're like, (laughs) comparing. It's destructive. And listen to me, men, I've seen you too. When a lady walks into the room and you're like, it's destructive. Comparing is always destructive. And, and God is saying to Gideon, Gideon, listen, first thing Gideon does, God, you're, God says, you're a mighty warrior. And, and, and Gideon says, no, I'm a big loser. And then God says, no, you're not a loser. And then Gideon says, well, if you were really with us, if you really loved us, then why did all these people get everything good and we get everything bad? Comparing, listen, there's a, there's a mindset. I want you to write this down in your notes, and, and then I want, you to, I want you to write somewhere in your notes near that Joshua chapter 12 and 13 and 14. I want you to write the words identity. Let God change your identity. You are who God says you are, not what people say you are. Your circumstances, your past, your present, your circumstances do not have the power to define who you are. Your identity is shaped only by the one who made you. I don't care what your daddy said. I don't care what your mama said. I don't care what your old boss said. I don't care what anybody said. You are who God says you are. Your identity has to get right for you to be able to do right. Circumstances you'll let God change your identity, it'll change the way you see your circumstances. And then I want you to write down the word comparison. You see, you see Gideon go into comparison. I want you to write down these, these words, just write down these, these letters, T-W-N-C, T-W-N-C, never allow yourself to get in TWNC, things will never change. Things will never change. Things are never going to change. Things can't change. Listen, things can change. God is trying to say to Gideon, listen, if you'll let me change your identity, you'll see that everything else can change. I see adults, 50-year-old men, go back to a family reunion, and that 50-year-old man turns into a 13-year-old kid. Because he's allowed his family to define him. And the only thing his family will remember him as is the little boy. Because that man doesn't have confidence in his identity. Our identity, your identity, for you to live with tangible, sustainable hope has got to be formed by God. You are who God says you are. Are. Listen to me. You, you should never let anyone else define you except the one who knit you together in your mother's womb. You want to hold on to hope? You want a tangible, sustainable hope? Remember, you are who God says you are. Number two, second thing, real quick. You have to, you have to adjust your perspective. You got to change your perspective. You want to keep a tangible, alive hope on the inside of you? Number, number, number one, you got you to change your definition of possible. How do you, how do you see what's possible instead of what's impossible? Possible. Allowing God to reshape your identity. And in shaping your identity, your circumstances will change. Not because they change, but because your actions change. I always tell my kids, you've heard me say it a million times. When you know who you are, you know what to do. I had somebody send me a text message the other day. Their 11-year-old daughter was having trouble with some kids at school. And there was some stuff going on. And... and um, her mom said, well, what do you want me to do? That little girl texted her back. And you know what she said to her? She said, she said, I know, I know. We always say in church, when you know who you are, you know what to do. 
that little girl knew how to handle herself with integrity and with character and with class because she knew who she was. When you know, listen, when you know who you are, you know what to do. It's, you got to have your perspective changed. Let me, let me tell you something interesting about ourselves. Here's what that means. Um, you got to change. You got to have your perspective changed. It means you got to see things differently. How many know if you look at something the same way all the time, that's what you're going to believe about that thing? But when you start looking at that thing differently from different angles, from different sides, your opinion of that thing can change, right? We have in, in, in your body, you, you got two eyes. We, 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 know we have um, um, binocular vision. That, that's just a big fancy way to say we have two eyes. But in the back of both of your eyes, there's actually a blind spot. And, and, and the only way that that blind spot is filled, it, it's, it, it, it's replaced, is when, is when you, your brain, your mind, and your action, your movement, your activity, your mind and your movement actually speak to the nerves that go from that point of your eyes to your brain. That's how we see. It's called tri triangulization. We, we can triangulate, but so often we have this, this, this binocular vision. We just look, and we have a set point that we look at, and when we look at it, we can't see that set point clearly. But when I move over here, and I move over here, all of a su sudden, triangulization begins to happen in my eyes, and I can see more clearly. It's like if you've ever been golfing, or you see somebody on a golf course, and, and, and the guy is trying to see the distance from the ball to the pin. They'll never just stand there and go like this. Because that set point can fool them. They'll move like this and they'll move like this because they get triangulation working in their eyes and they get a clearer picture of what it is they're trying to look at. You do it when you're driving down the road. You're driving down the road. You look up a couple hundred yards and you see a police officer sitting up there and he's got a gun pointing at you. And you think, is that a firearm? Nope, it's a radar detector. And you're like, I wonder how far, how far that gun can reach. But none of you ever see that cop and you're like, you're always like, because you're, 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 you're triangulating. You're enabling a clearer picture. And when you have a set point, that's what God's trying to say to Gideon. Gideon, you got to get up and move. You've got to create some action. There's got to be some activity because you have the wrong set point. You've been looking at the wrong thing. And so many times we look at the same thing the same way all the time. And it gives us, listen, you can be full. Your vision can be can be uh, blurred or it can be made. Let me show you. Let me show you rather than tell you. Um, how many have ever heard of an optical illusion? You know what an optical illusion does? It tricks your eyes. It tricks your vision. You know your circumstances can trick your vision. Watch this. Um, I got a few off the internet. I sent them into him. Show that first one. Look at that. He's going to crush Stonehenge. That man is going to step on Stonehenge. You can't destroy a historic site. You know what? You know what's happening. Stonehenge is a long ways off, a camera sitting on the ground, and he's got his foot very close to the camera. He's just fooled your vision. Go, go to the next one. Look, look at these guys. That guy's going to fall. He's going to fall. He's going to die. Now go to the next one. No, nah, he's just jumping on a rock. <laughs> go to the next one. This guy's going to fall. Save your friend. Now go to the next one. No, nah, they're just laying on the side of the road. <laughs> you, you see what happened? That, that your, your vision was tricked. And the same thing is true in, in, in your life. When, when, we, when we don't recognize that, that, that when you have a set point, when you're reasoning everything from a set point, I see it, I see it this way, and you're not moving to the left and looking at it from a different angle, and you're not, you're not trying to find a different perspective. And God is saying to Gideon, no, listen, I need you to do some things, Gideon. I need you. Listen to, listen to this, verse 14. The Lord turned to him and he said, Go in the strength that, I, that you have and save Israel out of, the Midian's, out of Midian's hands. Am I not sending you? 
see he's beginning to change his perspective. Stop looking at going into the battle in your own strength. Stop looking at this fight the way you've been looking at this fight. Get up and move around. You have to change your vision. You, you have, you've got the wrong set point. The set point is not the problem. The set point is me. You've got to see the problem differently. And when you look around, you'll begin to see me is what God says. Watch he, this is, he goes on and, and he says, but Lord, Gideon asked, how can I save Israel? My clan's the weakest, and I'm the least of all my family. Now what's most amusing to me about this is not what God says, it's what God does not say. Because God doesn't try to pump him up. You know how sometimes when you're talking to people and they're all down and discouraged, what do you try to do? You try to build them up. I mean, if it were me and Gideon says, I'm weak, I'm small, I'm strong, I'd have been like, no, man, come on. You've been pumping out P90X. You are the man. You are a mighty warrior. You can do this. But God didn't do any of that. God just kind of silently agreed with him. He's like, yep, you're a mess. Your family's a mess. You're a coward. But God says, the Lord answered Bible is, I think I said the first service, the Bible is so predictable sometimes because God never changes. And in that moment when Gideon is, is cowering down, even to the call that God has on his life to be a warrior, to set his family free, to set his people free, listen to me, God has a call on some of your lives to set the people around you free. To be a warrior for your family, a warrior in your career, a warrior for the things that matter. We're just like Gideon. Oh, well, why does this keep happening? You know me, I've lost every time. Every time I try to do right, I end up doing wrong. It's like God speaks to Gideon. He says, yeah, you're right. You're a loser. Your family's compromised. God says to Gideon what he always says to us. I love this. He says, I will be with you and you will strike all the Midianites together. In other words, yeah, Gideon, you're right. All those things you said about yourself, they may be true. But I am with you. And when I am with you and you know I'm with you, everything changes. And you will wipe out the Midianites. I know there's 20,000 of you and 120,000 of, of them. But I'm telling you, I am with you and this will happen. You're going to see me do above and you're going to see me do beyond. You're going to see me do what you can't do in your own ability. And Gideon, it, it, it's power. in that moment, Gideon, who had this narrow binocular view in his moment of, of, of weakness, he began begins to see a, he begins to see a glimpse of hope you've done three miracles you've declared that I'm a mighty warrior you promised that you would give me peace you promised that you would be with me Gideon is beginning to see he's just beginning to see a little bit of hope and all of a sudden Gideon Gideon hears God say Gideon I'd like for you just to take a few steps to the left a few steps to the right and I'd like for you just to refocus and this time when you do, you're not going to see the circumstances that you've always seen. This time, God says, this time when you refocus, you triangulate. He says, you're going you're gonna to begin to see me. Where you, where you used to look and you would see what your family said and what your culture said and what your enemy said, you're going to see me. And then you're going to look again and you're going to see me again. And then you're going to look over here and you're going to see me again. And all of a sudden, your perspective will change. Because rather than seeing what they said and he said and she said, you're going to see what God said. And then you'll see what they said. And you'll view what they said in light of what he said. And God says it begins to change everything. It's 
So what do you do? You want to hear it real practical, real simple, real easy? How do you change your perspective? You move. Physically move. You physically get up and move. Set your eyes on another set point. Look at what you're looking at it, but look at it differently. And then number two, you just do what God says do. Just do what God says do. It's in His Word. Where do you get the information from? Get it from the right people. Talk to the right people. Too many, time we, too many times we don't close our ears to the wrong voices. Listen, if you're, you know, if you're struggling with your, your marriage and you're, you're thinking about going through a divorce, don't talk to a person who's not a believer and been through a bunch of divorces themselves. Close your ears to the wrong voices and open your ears to the right voices. That's why it's so important for you to be engaged in small groups. Because you need other like-minded people who are filled with the Spirit of God who can speak truth and life into your life whenever the world is speaking false truth. Powerful picture. Powerful picture that God, God's painting here. Let me give you this third one, then I'll close. It's this. Number three. Change your definition of what's possible. You've got to take these action steps, physical perspective. Change that perspective. Here's, here's the third one. You've got to build a monument of faith moments in your life. Build, build, build a monument. Build something that lasts forever. So many times it feels like God's not speaking or we can't hear God or you, you hear sermons and it doesn't do anything for us. But then there's other times that you hear a scripture or you read a passage of scripture or you hear a sermon or you hear a song. And it's like the truth inside that jumps off the page and, and it just, it kind of gravitates to you. It's right, I, that's exactly what I needed to hear at this exact moment. You know what that is? That's a monument at a moment. That's a spiritual Mo moment that you can build a monument in that, in that moment. Listen to what Gideon says. Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord. And he explained, oh, sovereign God, I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. And most of us would be like, that's awesome for Gideon. He's like, no, that's awful. Because in that day, they believed if you saw the Lord, you died. Because a human couldn't handle the presence of the Lord. So at first he's afraid that he's going to die at the hands of the enemy. And now he's afraid that he's going to die because he's seen the Lord. But the Lord spoke back to him in his moment of fear. And God says to him what changes everything for him. And God says this, but the Lord said to him, peace. Do not be afraid. You, Gideon, he says, are not going to die. Gideon's biggest fear is that he's going to die, and God meets him at that place. And he says, Gideon, be at peace. You're not going to die. And then Gideon begins to believe. All of a sudden, Gideon gets this higher purpose moment. His hope begins to rise. He begins to believe. Maybe I won't die. And God said to Gideon, you will not die. I don't know about you, but I think that probably changed everything for Gideon. I think that was a, that was a, a, a monumental moment. It was a faith moment that he could build monuments upon. So whenever Gideon faced future battles, he faced future mountains, he faced future obstacles, rather than running from them to a cave to hide, he would run to the problem, he would run to the enemy, he would run to the obstacle, and he would say, listen, I'm not going to run from you, I'm going to run to you, because God said he would be with you, that I could walk in peace, and I would not die. So it increased his courage. Listen, you know what shatters our hopes? Our hopes die when we stop walking towards what we're hoping for. And you need to build monuments in your life of, of moments of faith, of faith moments that remind you that God is a God who will be faithful. Story, true story, maybe you've heard it before, of a guy who, um, he loved baseball. Matt, hey, bring me that bat. Thank you. He, um, he loved baseball. He had two brothers that were, that were good, good ball players. They, they both played in college, and he wanted to, but he was never able to, and he, um, he's about five years old and his dad left. He was never real disappointed at his dad leaving because when his dad left, all the yelling in the house stopped. 
this and that. If you're yelling in the house, stop. Just stop. Just stop. His dad left, married another woman, had some more kids. Kid was okay for a while. He got about 12 years old. At about 12 years of age, he began to realize he couldn't play ball as good as his brothers could play ball. And he realized he wasn't as good as them, and he had nobody to play with him in the backyard. And he began to think, if I, if I had my dad, if I had somebody to play with me, I could be as good as them. And he got bitter, and he got angry, and it led to a lot of reckless behavior, a lot of destructive behavior. Until he was about 19 years old, he had a friend. He had a friend say this to him. He said, he said how long are you going to carry that? Are you going to carry it so long that you carry it into your relationship with your boy? Or are you going to let your daddy go? Are you going to forgive your dad and realize your dad wasn't able to give you what your dad did not have? When are you going to give your dad to God? Just a short time later, he was at a, a youth conference. He wasn't a follower of Jesus, but he, but he gave his life to Jesus. He came down to an altar and he prayed. This prayer said, God, I forgive my dad. Forgive my dad. I'm going to give him to you. I love my dad. I don't want to harm my dad. He said God healed his heart. And he went the next years of his life just in complete victory. He began to tell a story all over the place about how God had healed that hurt in, in his life. And until he had his first son. And he says he's standing in the hospital holding his, first, his firstborn little boy. And as he did, his dad, he, he said all that bitterness came right back inside. He began to think, how could, how could you leave me? I could never leave my son. How could you run off, marry somebody else, have more kids, and pretend like I didn't even exist? He was bitter all over again. It lasted a few days, and he found a place to get with God again and pray, God, you've got you to help me forgive my dad. I've forgiven him. I've got to let him go. i put him in your hands. Forgive him. It went away for a couple of years until he had his next daughter. He's holding his daughter, and all that bitterness comes back again. Same thing, he finds a place to pray. Third kid comes along, holds that kid. Here comes the bitterness again. He knows what to do. He knows how to, listen, you know what he's doing? He's building monuments. He's building moments because, listen, most of us, most of us will, will not have this miraculous moment that whatever we're facing, whatever we're going against, you know, we're just healed miraculously and we never struggle with it again. Most of us will not experience it that way. That's what I love about Gideon. His victory was step by step, progress after progress, winning one battle at a time. And then about 12 years old, his son reached about 12, and they're in the backyard. They're playing, playing catch, and his little boy threw him a ball, and it was a little high, and he said he reached up to catch the ball, and he heard that leather, the glove snap, and it was like heaven snapped its fingers and said to him, I know you didn't have the daddy that you wanted, but if you'll be the daddy to your son that you never had but always wanted, I will heal your heart forever. That man, that daddy, that daddy still carries that baseball glove around today. You know what that baseball glove is? It's a monument. That, that, that story reminds me of my dad's story because my dad didn't have the daddy wanted. My dad heard God tell him one day, Robert, just because you didn't have the daddy you wanted doesn't mean you can't be the dad that you always wanted. And because my dad heard that and that monument for him, he gives me and my brother the gift of a father that he never had but always wanted. And because he gave that away, his heart was healed forever. i never forget my moment. My, my, my moment, I played a lot of ball growing up and a lot of baseball. I'll never forget. Some of you have heard this story. I won't tell the whole thing because of time. But I was, I was playing ball and I had, had, had it was a double hitter. I had gotten a base hit at the end of one game and, and won the ball game. And everybody cheered. The very next game, I struck out and lost the game. And I'll never forget standing over home plate with this bat. Holding the bat between my legs like this. And I heard his voice from out of the stand scream, That's my boy! That's my boy! That's my dad. And I'm telling you, as many ball games as I played, for a long time I played a lot of ball. Every time I stand up to the plate, I'm reminded. Whether I hit the ball or whether I strike out, whether I hit a home run, a single, I walk or I strike out, I'm still his boy. And I'm telling you what that did for me. As I go through life, when I strike out in life, I still hear this voice saying, that's my boy. 
That's my boy. Because my failure didn't define me. You got to build, listen, you got to build monuments of faith moments in your life so that you can go back. Do you have moments that you built monuments? Do you have those places that you can look back to and you can say, I remember where I was when God did this for me. I remember the car I was driving in when the Holy Spirit spoke to me. I remember the altar I was, I was praying in whenever God healed my hurt. I, I remember the person I was talking to whenever God healed my hurt. Do you have monuments of faith moments? God wants you to. Father, in the name of Jesus, today, Today, I just pray for every person in this room, God, that you would would raise the level of hope in our lives, that you would help us to expect more, not because of what the world says about us or what our family says about us, but like Gideon, God, shape our identity because of what you say about us. And when we see who we are, We'll never look at our circumstances. We'll never look at our problems again. Because the bigger we see our God, the smaller our circumstances become. God, would you build monuments of faith moments in our life for the one who's here today and they know that their hope level is low. They know that they're not expecting everything they should be expecting. God, would you begin to rebuild that hope on the inside? Would you do that for us today? If you're here and you'd say, Scott, the Holy Spirit's speaking to me right now. I'm not seeing myself the way God sees me. My hope's not where my hope needs to be. I'm not expecting out of my life what I believe God is expecting out of my life. I want to expect more, but I want those expectations to be in alignment with his expectations. Scott, I need those monuments of faith moments in my life. Pray for me. Pray for me. If that's you, if that's you, just raise your hand all over the room if it's you. Holy Spirit, right now you see every hand that's raised. You know every heart that needs this day, this moment to be that moment that they can build a monument upon. God, speak to every heart in this room who needs you, who's open to you, so that our hope can be real, living, and tangible, so that we are expecting more. Today, God, do that for us. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, let it, let it happen today. Today. If you're here and you don't know Jesus, what he wants most is to know you so he can show you and he can go with you. But if you're here today and you'd say, Scott, I don't think I know Jesus that way. I don't think I know him that way. But I want to. I need him to show me. I need him to go with me. Pray for me. If that's you, just raise your hand. I want to know Jesus that way. I want to know Jesus today in a way that I can hear his voice. God bless you. I see you. God bless you. Hold him up until I see you. God bless you. I see you. God bless you. Yeah. Anybody else? Hold those hands up high for me. God bless you. I see you. God bless you in the back. God bless you over here on this side. Anybody else? God bless you. God bless you in the back. I see you. Come on, let's let's pray with those. If you just raised your hand, we're all going to pray this prayer with you. The Lord Jesus is going to move into your heart. He's going to save you. He's going to forgive you. He's going to give you a brand new vision for your life. He's going to speak to you. And he's going to change you. Come on, let's pray with those who raised their hands. Say it out loud. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace. That's more than enough. Forgive me today for all of my sins. Thank you for dying on a cross so that I could be forgiven. Thank you, thank you for raising from the dead so that I could raise to new life. I receive that new life today. Empower me by the Holy Spirit. Help me live for you forever. 
in Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Come on, let's celebrate with heaven right now what God's doing in all of those lives.